why is it on the internet some people think you're such a terrible scholar or a terrible such a terrible person? Why why does that come up? Um I don't know. I it... Hi, I'm Dan Vogel. Recently, Fair President Scott Gordon sat down with Mormon Egyptologist John Gee for what they termed a virtual fireside titled Ask the Egyptologist, which was posted on YouTube on the 19th of December, 2021. During the course of the interview, Gee repeated many of his old apologetic arguments, including his theory that the Book of Abraham was translated from a lost portion of the papyri, but he also presented new criticisms of those who believe the papyri that Joseph Smith pretended to translate was among the fragments the New York Metropolitan Museum returned to the LDS Church in 1967. Gee was well prepared with slides to defend the Book of Abraham's antiquity, but much of his conversation centered on the English texts Smith and his scribes produced, including the valuable discovery notebooks, the Egyptian alphabets, the grammar and alphabet volume, and the Book of Abraham translation manuscripts. In dealing with these documents, Guy's training as an Egyptologist was of little help. In fact, it seemed to get in the way, and to prevent him from viewing the documents as Joseph Smith and his scribes would have. Since this was Guy's latest attempt to publicly defend his lost scroll theory, I thought it would be a favorable opportunity to provide the public with a critique of his arguments and evidence, many of which were dealt with in my latest book, Book of Abraham Apologetics, a review and critique, published by Signature Books in Salt Lake City. After reviewing Guy's accomplishments as an Egyptologist, Gordon asked why he had so many critics, especially on the Internet. Guy responded that he did not know and went on to claim that it was all ad hominem and without substance. Well, there are a number of, of reasons that it might, but it's a, one of these vague general accusations that doesn't have any details, and it's a form of um, the, the typical uh, expression for it is uh, called poisoning the well. Mm -hmm. And it's where you, it's a form of an, uh, of an ad hominem fallacy. It's one where you shift the attention from the argument to the arguer. And rather than deal with the substance of the argument, you attack the person. So uh, by claiming that you're a terrible scholar, a terrible person, this isn't really something my Egyptological colleagues say to me, or at least not to my face, um, and some of them are actually fairly complimentary. Guy may very well be a good scholar in his field of Egyptology. That's not the issue. It's how he applies it to the Book of Abraham that gets him into trouble. Specifically, his handling of the English documents generated by Smith and his scribes in their pursuit to understand, preserve, and translate the Egyptian papyri, which has little to do with Egyptology. I mean, you're, you've edited an Egyptological journal. You've, yeah. uh, you've been on the board for different organizations. organizations. Certainly, certainly they wouldn't invite you to be on the board if they thought you were a terrible scholar, one would think. Oh, yeah, one would think. Um, it's, it, but it's a, a, it's a matter of, a way of distracting uh, the argument so you don't actually deal with the argument, you just attack the person. So, according to Guy, no one on the internet has made substantive criticisms of his Book of Abraham scholarship. This is simply not true. Three years ago, I began posting eight videos criticizing specific arguments he has given in his publications. Most disturbingly, he equates those who question his theories and scholarship, including his fellow Mormon scholars, 
with religious persecution. And it's something that we actually should expect as Christians. Um, you know, we have statements of Jesus, ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that endureth to the end shall be saved. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more shall they call them of his household? Mm -hmm. And uh, he also said, blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely. Right. Uh, for my sake, rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. Uh, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Yeah. And you get this outside the church, but also inside the church, surprisingly enough. Mm -hmm. And uh, you have a, another prophecy of Jesus. The time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God's service. Oh, yeah. uh, this is a good thing that they're doing. And um, and you also remember what James said, Know ye not, not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. So it, and, and vice versa. So even those in the church like Brian Hauglid Terrell Givens, Samuel Brown, and Robin Jensen, who reject Gee's theories or question his scholarship, are enemies because, as Gee sees it, they have made friends with the world, that is, the anti-Mormons. Okay, so let's go on to the next question then. So there's a couple of theories. There's the catalyst theory, there's the missing scroll theory. Are you open to the catalyst theory or do you remain confident the book of Abraham was the missing scroll? Well, I think I'm the scholar most associated with the missing scroll theory. Um, and I think I probably laid out most of the arguments that are used for that theory. Um, and so there are three theories. There's basically one, the one pushed by the anti-Mormons, which says we, Joseph Smith translated the Book of Abraham from the fragments that we currently have. Um, and the missing scroll theory says that there were other papyri that Joseph Smith have that we no longer have, and that is a better match for where the Book of Abraham comes from. And the third theory is that there, the, the papyri served as a catalyst for Joseph Smith to get revelation and that it wasn't on any of the, the scrolls. Uh, so it wouldn't, now it wouldn't matter what was on the scrolls because it just, right. it just inspired him to write something. It inspired him to get revelation. Now, mm -hmm. um, whether you're inside or outside of the church kind of depends on what you think the source of that revelation is or what you might think revelation is, but that's those are the three general theories. Uh, well, the one theory the I think the that the Book of Abraham comes from scrolls that we currently have, that's readily falsifiable. So it's scientific in in that sort of sense because you can, demonstrate that that one doesn't isn't true and I think that's why the um, the critics prefer that theory right um, but it's also falsifiable in the sense that if you go back and look at eyewitness statements they indicate that it's not on the scrolls that we currently or the fragments that we currently have we don't have any scrolls mm -hmm. and so it's also falsifiable in that sense. Guy refers to people who saw the mummies in papyri who said that one of the scrolls contained the writings of Abraham, which Guy and Kerry Mielstein, another Egyptologist at BYU, incorrectly interpret to mean that the Book of Abraham wasn't on the fragments which had been mounted on thick paper that were returned to the LDS Church, but rather on the intact scroll that had been burned in the Great Chicago Fire of 1871. Here, it should be observed that in making these claims, they are no longer operating as Egyptologists, but as historians of early Mormon history, 
and that neither of them has any special expertise in this area. I have examined these claims and misinterpretation of historical sources in my seventh video. This material is also conveniently published in my new book, Book of Abraham Apologetics. The problem with the sources Guy and Mielstein use is that none of them distinguish between the approximately two-foot intact scroll from the end of Hor's Book of Breathings and the three detached fragments glued to the thick paper. In other words, none of them say the fragments did not contain the Book of Abraham or that the intact scroll included a second record following the facsimile 3 vignette. As I will discuss in a moment, the use of these sources by Guy and Mielstein is entirely polemical. So that leaves the other two theories, and for a long time I couldn't find anything that would indicate any evidence that would indicate which one of those might be preferable. Uh, but in the end I found two or three pieces of evidence that seemed there, that indicate that the missing scroll theory accounts for more of the evidence than the catalyst theory. And so that is the one that I prefer mm -hmm. because that's where the evidence tends to, to indicate to. I'm, I'm open to the the catalyst theory. I considered it seriously for years. I haven't, it, I haven't considered it seriously in years because it do, there's not enough evidence for it and there's more evidence to indicate that Joseph Smith, uh, so one of the pieces of evidence besides that the statement that Joseph Smith makes when he introduces the book of Abraham that this is records that have fallen to, into our hands from the catacombs of Egypt. But there's also one of the last discourses he made in Nauvoo quotes language from the book of Abraham. Mm -hmm. And Joseph Smith said that he got that. It says it's Abraham's reasoning and says that he learned it from just translating a papyrus that's in his house. As evidence against the catalyst theory, Guy refers to the heading Joseph Smith published with the Book of Abraham in 1842. A translation of some ancient records that have fallen into our hands from the catacombs of Egypt, purporting to be the writings of Abraham while he was in Egypt, called the Book of Abraham, written by his own hand upon papyrus. A second piece of evidence Guy offers is to a sermon Joseph Smith delivered in Nauvoo on the 16th of June, 1844, where he alluded to Abraham 3.18 about intelligences existing one above another in an eternal succession, and stated that he had learned it by translating the papyrus now in my house. Those who espouse the catalyst theory believe Joseph Smith incorrectly thought his revelation on Abraham came from the papyri. However, similar to Guy, they have difficulty explaining that the text twice refers to facsimile 1 for a representation of the altar and Egyptian gods. In my video 7 and chapter 7 of my book, I discuss in detail the failed attempts of both Guy and the proponents of the catalyst theory to escape this textual evidence. It's not the best evidence. Mm -hmm. So we get that from notes that somebody made and it's possible that the notes are inaccurate, but it's least some evidence. And it indicates that Joseph Smith says that he got it from a papyrus and he translated it into his house. That, I think, um, so it's one of the few statements that we have that comes from Joseph Smith that indicates anything about the translation of the Book of Abraham. So it's a, a good source. It's, uh, and it seems to indicate uh, that that's what he thought. And so 
that's why I go with that theory because I think the evidence supports that and I don't get uh, I don't find direct evidence that supports the catalyst theory I it's a I think a decent second choice mm -hmm. but I think it's a second choice at least for me and as far as I can tell with the evidence Guy does not discuss a fourth possibility which I have suggested the pious fraud theory. According to this theory, Smith believed he was inspired to dictate a pseudepigraphic text dealing with Abraham to substantiate some of his new priesthood innovations like the high and patriarchal priesthoods and doctrine of preexistence. Unlike the catalyst theory, which has Joseph Smith mistakenly believing he was translating from the Hor Papyrus, the pious fraud theory posits that Smith knew he was only pretending to translate to increase faith in his revelation among his followers. Let's move on to the next question then. Um, who are those unnamed and unsourced Mormon and non-Mormon eyewitnesses who saw the long scroll? Uh, this is uh, typical of some of the questions we got in. It's uh, somewhat... Yeah. Um, Someone antagonized and just, a little bit. <laughs> yeah, unnamed and unsourced. Um, at least in, I've got a whole article on the uh, on the witnesses to to the. So they the are diary. named and they are sourced. They are named and they are sourced. And in my book, I named and sourced the ones I quoted from. So I'm not sure where they're getting this from, but I put together a, a quick list of. Mm -hmm. The, from the ones that I cited of who they are. So the Latter-day Saint one, we have W.W. Phelps in 1835 and Joseph Smith in 1835 and Oliver Cowdery in 1835, Warren Parrish in 1838, um, William Appleby in 1841, uh, Robert Horn in 1893, and uh, Jerusha Blanchard. The publication of this is in 1922. Mm -hmm. um, but Jerusha Blanchard was uh, in the Joseph Smith home before then, and this is, but by the time her account gets published, it's 1922. Guy was asked to provide evidence for his long scroll theory, that is, that the scroll was longer than an ordinary Book of Breathing's roll, which would be about five feet long. However, none of Guy's sources establish his theory. Perhaps he misunderstood the question, since he answers as if there were a dispute about whether or not there was a roll in addition to the fragments. No one disputes that in addition to the three detached fragments at the beginning of Hor's Papyrus, there remained an intact ending portion, measuring about four inches wide by about two feet long, which included at least two columns of text and concluded with facsimile three. Guy's list of witnesses is therefore quite useless in establishing his theory. On the 17th of July, 1835, Phelps wrote his wife that Smith had purchased four Egyptian mummies and two papyrus rolls, besides some other ancient Egyptian writings, and Cowdery mentioned the two scrolls in the Messenger Navigate in December, 1835. Parrish only claimed that he pinned down the translation of the Egyptian hieroglyphics as Joseph Smith claimed to receive it by direct inspiration from heaven. In Guy's circular reasoning style, he perhaps thinks that since Smith is translating Egyptian characters and Hor's text isn't the Book of Abraham, therefore there must be another text attached at the end. Appleby only mentions that he saw the rolls of papyrus and the writings thereon. However, he describes scenes that we know were among the fragments as if they were on the intact scrolls, stating that he saw the idolatrous priest Elkanah, who attempted to offer up Abraham as a sacrifice to their idol gods in Egypt, as represented by the altar, etc., Horn only said he handled the records and that one contained the writings of Abraham. Blanchard only reported that she saw the mummies and that in the arms of the old king lay the roll of papyrus from which our prophet translated the book of Abraham 
Of course, the scroll was not still there in the early 1850s when she was about five, so her statement cannot be used to argue that the Book of Abraham came from the intact scroll as opposed to the mounted fragments. Milstein gives a somewhat different list of eyewitnesses in support of the long scroll theory, which I examine in detail in my video 7 and chapter 7 of my book. Nevertheless, both Guy and Milstein mishandle their sources. Non-Latter-day Saints, uh, we have an A. Gardner, don't know what the A stands for, but this was published in the newspaper in 1835, William West in 1837, an anonymous newspaper report in 1840, um, Charlotte Haven's letters in 1843, Henry Coswell in 1843, um, Charles, Fran or Charles Francis Adams, uh, his journal entry from 1844. Uh, Josiah Quincy, who's also present for that, he published his in 1883, but the uh, but they were both there and at the same interview with Joseph Smith. Got it. Yeah. Um, some Quaker who just signed the initial M hmm. okay. in his report in 1846. The A. Gardner item is a report of the public display of the mummies and records in Cleveland that appeared in the Painesville Telegraph on the 27th of March, 1835, three months before they arrived in Kirtland. The description of the mummies and papyri was actually introduced by A. Gardner, apparently a pseudonym, and the report was written by Farmer, which merely mentions that three of the mummies each had a scroll on their chests. West only mentions that the records were torn by being taken from the roll of embalming salve, which contained them, and some parts entirely lost, but says nothing that would help Guy's case. The anonymous 1840 source said Smith showed him the mounted and framed fragments, and that he said, there, pointing to a particular character, that is the signature of the patriarch Abraham, which is opposite of what Guy and Milstein argue. Haven wrote to her own mother that Mother Smith opened a long roll of manuscript, saying it was the writing of Abraham and Isaac, written in Hebrew and Sanskrit. She identified the roll as the writing of Abraham, not the source of the published book of Abraham. There is nothing to indicate that the long roll was anything more than the approximately two-foot scroll containing the end section of Hoare's Book of Breathings. Caswell also proves just the opposite of what Guy and Milstein argue, stating that during his visit to Nauvoo in the spring of 1842, Smith opened a drawer and drew forth a number of glazed slides, like picture frames containing sheets of papyrus with Egyptian inscriptions and hieroglyphics. By some inexplicable mode, Mr. Smith had discovered that these sheets contained the writings of Abraham, written with his own hand while in Egypt. The Charles Francis Adams source also does not help Guy's case. On the 15th of May, 1844, Adams recorded that when Smith showed him and Josiah Quincy the framed papyri fragments, that Smith said, among other things, this was written by the hand of Abraham and means so-and-so. If anyone denies it, let him prove the contrary. I say it. Quincy, who was present with Adams, recorded in 1883 that Smith, when referring to the framed fragments, had said, That is the writing of Abraham, the father of the faithful. According to the unnamed Quaker source, Lucy Smith produced a black-looking roll, which she told us was papyrus, found on the breast of the king, part of which the prophet had unrolled and read. The scroll Lucy evidently produced was the intact end of Hoare's Book of Breathings, and the first part that Joseph Smith had unrolled and read could either refer to this fragment or the part that had broken off probably the latter. And Gustavus Seyfarth in 1856. Now, Seyfarth is 
one of the more interesting of these because Seyfarth was a retired uh, university professor from Germany mm -hmm. who in his retirement settled in the United States. And Seyfarth was a rival to Champollion. Mm -hmm. And so he had his own decipherment of Egyptian that he published earlier. It's not the one we use. Um, one of the critiques of it was that no one else could figure it out. Okay. <laughs> he was a superb copyist. Mm -hmm. So if you look at his copies of Egyptian documents, uh, it's like reading the actual document. He is that good. It's like he's an ancient Egyptian scribe. Mm -hmm. But his translations have to be carefully dealt with because they don't m match the version that came through Champollion. And uh, Seyfarth saw the Joseph Smith papyri and describes them hmm. and translates what he thought was on them. Okay. Uh, and I went looking through Seyfarth's papers to see if he actually had a copy and unfortunately or fortunately depending on your point of view, um, all of his copies come from his trips to see museums in Europe. Oh. And so he doesn't have, that I could find, a copy of what he saw in St. Louis. Too bad. <laughs> uh, too bad, or... Or, or yeah. I, I don't know, when I, when I was looking through the papers, I thought, had this horrible thought. What if he actually copied the Book of Abraham, mm -hmm. and I found it? And no one would believe me if I found it. <laughs> right. So it was a good thing it wasn't there. <laughs> That's true. When Seyfarth examined the Joseph Smith papyri at the St. Louis Museum in 1856, he found that the purported Abraham scroll was not a record, as Smith had claimed, but an invocation to the deity Osiris, in which occurs the name of the person, Horus, and a picture of of the attendant spirits introducing the dead to the judge, Osiris. Seyfarth was, of course, looking at the intact approximately two-foot end of Hor's Book of Breathings, which included the facsimile three vignette. His description gives no indication that any other text followed the vignette on the scroll. Let's move on. <laughs> so... Is it, so we have the facsimiles. We have the Book of Abraham and we have the facsimiles. Is it possible the interpretations on the facsimiles were not meant by Joseph Smith to be considered canonized scripture? Um, well, yeah, it's possible. But here, here again, there's a problem with the question as phrased. Yeah. Um, I don't know that we ever get Joseph Smith talking about canonized scripture. Oh, interesting. And the other problem is that we don't know that the interpretations on the facsimiles are actually Joseph Smith. Oh. We don't know that for certain. We, we assume that's the case. I assume that's the case. But we can't prove it. And if somebody wanted to argue that Willard Richards provided the interpretations, we couldn't prove it false because all the manuscripts for the interpretations we have are in Willard Richards' hand. Here we have a glimpse into Guy's thinking as an apologist. Because the Egyptian grammar is in the handwriting of W. W. Phelps, Guy thinks that no one can contradict his assertion that Phelps authored it, although Smith's history, that Phelps helped to write, says Smith is the author and it contains the handwriting of Warren Parrish, another of Smith's scribes, at the end. Why would Parrish be writing in Phelps's book? Even without these evidences, why doesn't Guy assume Joseph Smith is the author of the Egyptian grammar on the same grounds? Some of the explanations to facsimile 2 were withheld and said to be found only in the temple, but Smith did not reveal his endowment ceremony for another couple of months. So that would be a problem should anyone wish to claim Richards, rather than Smith, was the author of the explanations. And how would Richards know which lines of Egyptian characters to apply such an explanation? Similarly, 
How would Phelps know which Egyptian characters went with which English definition? Simply, no one would think of removing Smith from his unique position as an inspired translator and interpreter of ancient records, unless they were motivated by apologetic necessity. Why do the characters from the papyri that we have show up sequentially in three different manuscripts from three different scribes with the column headers of character and translation. I've seen this. I've seen this argument several times on the internet. I see it on Reddit frequently, yeah. and I've been emailed in. And so that's this is this is kind of a big big deal. One. And 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 again, this is one of those things where there's a little bit of misinformation. So we'll pull up um, Book of Abraham manuscript one. Okay. This is one of the manuscripts. Character is written in the left margin. Um, it's a little bit damaged, but it doesn't say that the other one is translation. So you have the text of the Book of Abraham on the other side. So it doesn't, the way that the question's framed is misunderstanding of the evidence because we do have one, and this is the only one that mentions the character in the margin. The reason Guy quibbles about this is because he wants to argue that the relationship between the characters in the margins and English text is unknown. Guy evidently thinks the heading on the other column is merely a title, but the second column is a translation. It reads, Translation of the Book of Abraham written by his own hand upon papyrus and found in the catacombs of Egypt. Why write characters in the first column? Anyone can see they are characters. Because the characters are directly related to the English translation in the next column. Phelps even numbered the first two characters and keyed them with specific English words in the translation. The relationship of the characters and English text is therefore obvious. When Parrish took over, he continued copying characters sequentially from the Hor Papyrus except where there were lacunae, or gaps, in the papyrus, and recorded their translation in the next column. A close examination of the three Abraham texts shows that some of the blocks of text began mid-sentence, suggesting that the characters were not afterthoughts, but integral to the creation of the documents, and that the relationship is indeed the translation of specific characters. So, we look at so here are all the character the pages of the manuscript with the characters in the margin in the margins and we'll kind of go through these one by one and look about where they come from okay so the theory is that joseph smith just took the characters off in in sequential lines um, and somehow knew that the characters read from right to left because if you look at some of the manuscripts uh, in those collections of papers, they're actually pulling the characters left to right. The three translation manuscripts have exactly the same characters taken from the Hor papyrus in the same order, from left to right. What happens in other documents is irrelevant, although it would indicate what we already know, that is, that Smith couldn't read Egyptian. What Guy refers to is unclear, but he may be referring to the fact that the columns that flank facsimile 1 are copied into the alphabets from right to left, that is, 3, 2, 1, and 5. The very short column 4, above Anubis's arm, is skipped. If the reason he mentions this is to show that Smith and his scribes didn't know what they were doing, we are in agreement. What follows is Guy's attempt to overturn what he calls the sequential theory. Since there is no question that the scribes copied the characters in sequence, Guy's extremely weak argument focuses on what happens to fill the lacunae, or gaps, in the papyrus. My responses to Guy's analysis of the characters, therefore, focuses on the gaps as well. Rather than simply filling the gaps with copied or invented characters, Guy wants to argue that the characters were being copied randomly 
for some other reason than translation, and that he doesn't know the reason. To admit the characters were being invented would imply that Smith was involved in deception, a conclusion Guy wants to avoid. However, I will show that Guy is making comparisons that don't exist and that his polemic against the sequential theory is forced and contrived to create confusion. What happens in the gaps is irrelevant and in no way overturns the sequential theory. So somehow these characters are known to be right from left, and that's correct, and they're supposed to go in that, that order. Uh, that's the theory. This is how it shows up in practice. So let's compare the characters. First character, this is the way it looks in the manuscript, okay. and this is on the left, and this is the way it looks on the papyrus. Uh, it's a little damaged in the papyrus, but that is or should be a reed leaf, and that um, isn't quite the way I do it, but it's very close to the way that it's done in Heretic and Egyptian. So that that one works. Uh, then the next character, which should be there, I pulled this from a, a fuller example later in the papyrus. You can see it's a... Um, it's a little bit neater made by the Egyptian scribe, but yeah, you can read that. The first two characters, the Reed and W. Loop characters, were visible when Smith and his scribes copied them at the end of their alphabets and translated them as Chaldea and Abraham. These characters can be seen in another book of breathings known as Papyrus Louvre and 3284 which Nibley conveniently reproduced on page 64 of his 1975 book, The Message of the Joseph Smith Papyri. Um, the next one, this is the way it should be. This is from the parallel text on the right, but you can see that they've kind of drawn that character in the margin. Mm -hmm. um, this isn't extant in the papyrus right now, but that's the next character that should show up. Guy proposes that this third character was also still visible, along with the first two, but that it was poorly copied by Phelps. There is no repetition of this character in the Horror Papyrus fragments, and so he uses the parallel text, Papyrus Louvre 3284, column 6, although Guy modifies the character to make it resemble what Phelps drew in the margin of his transcription of the first three verses of the Book of Abraham. The character represents drag, or in this case, tow, as in towing Osiris into the lake or pool of Khonsu. However, it seems more probable that Phelps copied the character from another location to fill the lacuna, or gap, in the papyrus. While the third character in Phelps's document looks different than what Guy proposes, it looks very much like another character that appears in column 2, next to facsimile 1, and copied into part 3 of the alphabets, where it is given the name Kai Abram Kai Abra Oem Zubzul Oen, which is the same name given in the grammar book to the third character in Phelps's transcription. This complex character was seen, incorrectly, to include as its first element the W loop character, which they associated with Abraham. The character that Phelps copied in the margin of his transcription of Abraham is more likely the image of a man with a staff, which is part of the name of Osiris, and by itself means great. The placement of this character in the lacuna is why Chicago Egyptologist Klaus Baer in his 1968 translation of the Hor Papyrus, designated this character, as well as the next two, as incorrectly restored. Um, then you get this character, um, mm -hmm. you know, and you can critique the, the modern scribe, but that's... Guy apparently believes the fourth character was copied from the intact papyrus, and is in the correct position because it is similar to the parallel text, although the ancient scribe would not have faced the character in that direction, and the short horizontal line is not part of the hieratic character 
in the Hor Papyrus. Guy compares it to the heretic character from line 3 in the next column over, which is a representation of the throne of Osiris. Given that the previous character was evidently taken from column 2 next to facsimile 1, and probably not copied from the papyrus as Guy believes, and also that the next two characters are invented, it is likely that this character was also invented, perhaps based on hieratic characters. A clue to its origin is possibly contained in the English text that accompanies the character. I sought for mine appointment unto the priesthood, according to the appointment of God, unto the fathers concerning the seed. As will become apparent, when filling the lacunae, Smith liked to invent characters by drawing on characters from part one of the alphabets that were associated with Princess Ketumen, who lived hundreds of years after Abraham. Considering the subject of the company translation is about Abraham seeking ordination as a rightful heir in the chain of ordinations extending back through his fathers to Adam, it seems likely that the character in question was invented based on the characters and parts of characters translated previously in the valuable discovery notebooks and part one of the alphabets concerning relative time. Unlike Guy's hieratic character, note that the first vertical line has a short horizontal line and that the second vertical line is slanted. A similar slanted line appears near the end of part one of Joseph Smith's alphabet and is defined Zubzul Oan, the beginning, first, before, pointing to. Below that definition is another for a long horizontal line ending with a slanted vertical line that closely resembles our fourth character, which receives this intriguing definition in Joseph Smith's alphabet. Zub, the first creation of anything, first institution. And below that, another vertical line with a horizontal line that intersects the vertical line at the center with the definition, Zul, from any or some fixed period of time, back to the beginning of creation. Though this character is slightly different than the one that appears in the margin of the translation documents, its definition and development in the five degrees of the grammar book is relevant. First degree, from any fixed period of time back to the beginning. Second degree, from Abraham's father back to his father, and so on back through the line of his progenitors. Third degree, showing the denomination of languages and through what descent they came, and are to continue by promise. Fourth degree, signifying the lineage that lawfully hold the keys of the kingdom of God by promise. Fifth degree, from any or some fixed period of time back to the beginning of creation, showing the chronology of the patriarchs, the right of priesthood, and the lineage through whom it shall be continued by promise, beginning at Abraham, signifying the promises made to Abraham, saying through thy fruits, or the seed of thy loins, the gospel shall be preached, unto all the seed, meaning from Noah, and unto all kindreds of the earth. As mentioned, this last character is a little different, than what appears in the middle of the fourth character, which might explain the notation at the top of the Frederick G. Williams and Warren Parish documents. The first vertical line, with a short horizontal line, joining in the center on the right side, looks like what Frederick G. Williams and Warren Parish drew at the beginnings of their documents, with the explanation that it is the sign of the fifth degree of the first, cancelled, second part because an exact replica of the character is not found in the alphabets or grammar book, they perhaps felt the slightly new part of the character needed some explanation. They at first associated it with part one, apparently with the other similar characters dealing with time back to creation, but then changed it to part two, possibly associating it with the number of high priests from Adam to the fifth high priest, who was Mahalalel, Enoch's grandfather, Abraham was twentieth in the line of patriarchs from Adam. Ultimately, the origin of the character is less important than the fact that Smith and his scribes were attempting to bridge the gap between the extant hieratic characters with invented or borrowed characters. So you have the, the following character. Uh, then you get uh, this nice character, um, and there's the hieratic on it. Not so fast, 
Professor Gee. The fifth group of characters is not hieratic and does not visually match what Gee shows, which he took from line three of the next column. It is also not what appears in the parallel text in Louvre, 3284. And the reason Klaus Baer labeled it as incorrectly restored. Uh, this one, I couldn't find a parallel on the papyrus for really? what this one was, but there it is. Uh, that's the next character in line. No sample of the sixth character because it's not hieratic and therefore not found on the parallel text either. And then you get this character. This is off the edge of the manuscript, and um, you can see they had a little bit more that they were looking at uh, in 1835 when this was done. Um, and there's some of the papyrus is flaked off a bit. This character is incorrectly restored, according to Nibley and the parallel text. For the remainder of this line, the scribe is merely copying what he sees. Uh, then you get this character and this character. And so you, you, you can read these off. This is the wear sign. Uh, this is the, the name Khonsu. Notice that unlike Guy's comparison of characters proposed for the lacuna, the scribe's copy of the preserved characters suddenly becomes greatly improved. Uh, then you get, you get these uh, two-hand signs. Guy compares these characters on the left that were invented to fill the lacuna at the beginning of the second line with a group of characters from the middle of the third line. It is doubtful that Smith's scribes copied these characters because visually, and that's all they had to go by, there is not a close resemblance between the two groups. Here, we get an opportunity to test Guy's analysis, because later, the scribes copied this group on line 3, and it looks nothing like the previous invented characters. As can be seen, when the scribe copies the group of characters Guy proposes was the source for the characters in the lacuna at the beginning of line 2, the scribe has trouble making the bottom curve, but it is nothing like the previous character. Whatever one thinks about the source of these characters, they were not copied from line three, as Guy suggests. Um, uh, then you get Gimas uh, from the papyrus. Continuing in the lacuna on line two, Guy compares the second group of characters to a group of characters from the middle of line 5. Again, there is no match. There is a footnote in the Jensen and Hauglid volume explaining, This character and the two that follow were written in a different ink flow than the rest of the characters, and they do not match any characters from the extant portions of the papyri. They are composites of characters from the Egyptian alphabet documents or grammar and alphabet volume. This is exactly right. Chicago Egyptologist Klaus Baer also labeled these characters as incorrectly restored. The text next to the characters provides a clue as to their origin. It is about the daughter of Ham discovering Egypt while it was still under water and later her sons settling in it. The middle character is not the one Guy identifies but one that came from the ta Sheret min papyrus, which, unlike Guy's character, has a line above and a dot in its curve. This dot appears in the alphabets and is developed in the five degrees of the grammar volume. This is the first page of Joseph Smith's alphabet, showing that the 15th character is the middle character in the group of characters from the margin of Parrish's translation document and has nothing to do with the characters Guy identifies. In Smith's alphabet, it is named and defined as Iota Tau S Zip Zai, the land of Egypt first seen underwater. In the fifth degree of the grammar book, it receives this explanation. The land of Egypt 
which was first discovered by a woman while under water, and afterwards settled by her sons, being a daughter of Ham. Rather than copying the group of characters Guy cites, the scribes are copying characters Smith invented by mixing bits of hieratic characters from other papyri. Of course, Guy doesn't want to see Smith inventing characters to fill the lacuna, so he is motivated to compare them to existing characters and claim they were poorly copied. And uh, so yeah, I get some other. Guy says nothing about this character because it's entirely invented and does not match the sample he provides, which he has taken from the beginning of line 7. This group of characters, like the previous one, comes from part 1 of the alphabets and appears in Joseph Smith's document as character 19. I'm amazed how detailed it is on the left side, how they're able to, you know, because I look at those, I go like, oh, really? That's like, I, yeah, I can kind of see that, but it's, it's tough. Yeah, it's, yeah. They, they're doing a pretty good job here, yeah. okay. uh, copying things. What do you mean they're doing a good job? They're not even the same characters. Even Gordon is finding it tough seeing what Guy is talking about. Once again... It is quite clear that there is no match between the invented composite character in the margin of Parrish's translation document and the group of characters Guy took from line 6 of the Hor Papyrus. Having now reached the other side of the lacuna, suddenly there is no problem seeing the comparison between the copied characters and their sequential source on the Hor Papyrus. Um, sometimes they're seeing better things than others. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, this is a really, this is clearly the mess sign for born of, but it's, well, um, it's kind of hard to recognize in the copy. And this mm -hmm. is, you can see where the lines fit there or in this one here. Um, so they're copying these characters pretty accurately, and they're dividing up the words properly, or pretty uh, by, by and large. Pro by and large. By so and large. so back, back here you have, this is a name uh, uh -huh. going back here, and this is the first part of the name, but this is a sep. The name is composed of a couple of words, and mm -hmm. they've got the, the split up the words in the name. Mm -hmm. uh, this one here... Uh, and you can you can kind of see yeah this is where they here they've got a little bit more of this character than we have in, currently preserved mm -hmm. um, this whole complex here this group of ten characters that appears in the lacuna at the beginning of line three is partly copied from the previous line with some dots and a circular character with a dot added with the last two characters being copied from the preserved text on the other side of the lacuna. Once they get to the preserved text, they suddenly become better copyists. And more of that there. So they, they follow through and they're, they're copying the stuff from the papyrus and they're doing a pretty good job. And so when we look at the implementation of this, what follows is Guy's implementation of the highly inaccurate identifications he has previously made about the sources of the characters copied in the margins of the three translation documents, which he will then use in an argument against what he calls the sequential theory. Unfortunately, he uses yellow in his demonstration. This is where this sign comes from, and the sign, and the sign. So slowly crawl across the screen. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know where that one comes from, but then this one comes from here and then there. And so they're slowly marching across that first line of right text. Right to left, yeah. Just, just right like to left. As we have seen, Guy's proposal for the characters in this first lacuna are questionable, and the last one left him puzzled. Nevertheless, he moves across the first line as if it were correctly restored by Smith, which is not the case. 
Rather, it is clear that except for the artificial restorations in the lacuna, the copying of characters is sequential. And then they skip down here. Whoa, wait a minute, that's not an order. That's not an order. That's also not the character they copied to feel the lacuna, Mr. Gordon. Remember what it looked like when they later copied the character? Regardless, whatever the true origin of the character, they intended it to be a restoration of lost characters in the lacuna at the beginning of line two. Keep in mind, as Guy proceeds in his jumping around the papyrus, that I have demonstrated that none of his comparisons to the characters in the lacunae match, but had other origins. So the pattern Guy is tracing is spurious. Observe also that after jumping around, Guy always returns to the line and matches the characters on the Hor papyrus sequentially to the characters in the translation documents. How he thinks this presentation overturns the sequential theory is a puzzle. And then they skip down here. And that's not way up. And then around. way down there, and then back up here, and then picking up the line again and going across. Okay. And back, and here we get the break. And jump over there. And so it's so to my mind, I originally, my, 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 oh, that's totally different than the theory. The, the, it, the theory, it should go this way. In reality, it jumps over the, over the place. But as we step through the characters, you can see, yeah, this looks like a pretty good copy of, of this. Um, it helps having learned to read the heretic um, mm -hmm. to recognize those characters. Obviously, Smith and his scribes couldn't read hieratic and could not make the connections Guy makes. They went by sight only. So when Guy proposes characters that do not visually match, then you know he is wrong. Why is it easy to visually match the characters the scribes copied in sequence, but difficult matching the characters Guy proposes for the lacunae? Guy tries to cover over this problem by claiming his ability to read hieratic helps him see things the critics can't. This is false, since Smith and his scribes couldn't read hieratic either. As I have shown, Guy's identifications are fiction, and the true origin of the invented characters is part one of the alphabets. Guy's performance here in no way overturns or answers the question of sequential copying of characters into the translation documents. But uh, still, this is not... They're not pulling them. They're pulling them from the papyrus, but not necessarily in the order, and they're filling in with extra groups of characters that are out of order. Huh. So, of course, my brain immediately goes to the question that I don't think there's an answer to. What in the heck were they doing? <laughs> Mr. Gordon, let me tell you. They were filling the gaps in the papyrus with copied and invented characters to create a continuous text to translate. Why would they need to fill the gaps? Why not just skip them if the characters had some meaning other than translation? Obviously, a translation requires a continuous source of characters. According to one account, Lucy Smith said that when Joseph was reading the papyrus, he closed his eyes and held a hat over his face and that the revelation came to him, and that where the papyrus was torn, he could read the parts that were destroyed equally as well as those that were there. As early as 1837, William West reported, These records were torn by being taken from the roll of embalming salve which contained them, and some parts entirely lost, but Smith is to translate the whole by divine inspiration. And that which is lost, like Nebuchadnezzar's dream, can be interpreted as well as that which is preserved. Naturally, Guy doesn't want to concede that Smith was inventing characters, and so he tries to find parallels, even if very poor ones, and tries to obscure the incongruence by claiming only someone who reads hieratic can see them. Again, 
No matter the sources of the characters that fill the lacunae, it is obvious that Smith restored the missing characters to create a continuous text to translate. I, I took a little more time with this one just mm -hmm. to show that you, when in answering these questions, you have mm -hmm. to look at the you the details are important to come up with your general situation, and you have to look carefully at the material you have, and and so you have to your theory needs to account for the details. Yeah, so in this case, you'd have to say the theory is that that was the translation method. They used that to translate the Book of Abraham, and if that's not possible because it doesn't go in order of the characters. I think we have discovered that Guy doesn't have a grasp of the details and that his argument against the sequential theory is both inaccurate and irrelevant. Next, Guy will attempt to argue that the characters were added after the English text, another inaccurate and irrelevant argument. In his publications, he has suggested that they were added as decoration or as a failed attempt to match up the translation with possible hieratic characters. Just, uh, yeah, it looks like the characters come in later. There are some other indications, some cases where the characters tend to um, flow out of their column. Uh, you know, when they draw the they draw the margin line and they write the characters in the margin, but in some cases they cross the column. Gee's theory is that the characters were added later to the beginnings of paragraphs in the margins of the three translation documents. He thinks that his theory is supported because in several instances the characters overrun the margin, and therefore they were unplanned additions. Of course, this doesn't prove the characters were added later, or that the translation of the characters was not intended. What Gee never mentions is that the margin line also intersects the English text. Guy's examples come from the translation book, where the margin line intersects not only with the characters but also with the English text. On page 6, the margin line intersects both text and character. Several questions arise from Guy's theory. If the margin line was drawn after the English text and before the characters, why would the line interfere with the text? If the characters were added as decorations, why would they add so many that it would overrun the margin? If the line was already drawn, why didn't they just avoid the line by writing smaller or continuing the characters on another line? There also doesn't appear to be an avoidance of the line by being more efficient with the space. Of the four pages of Frederick G. Williams' document, a margin line was added to only three pages. On the last page, we have an example of four characters without a margin line, implying that the margin lines were drawn after the characters. This is not what we would expect if Guy's theory were true. The translation document that was cut from the translation book provides evidence that the line was drawn after both the characters and text and it was drawn so as to miss as much of the text and characters as possible. The pages of the translation book were ruled with 34 blue lines, which are now faded. The black horizontal line I have drawn on page 3 is aligned with the text, and the vertical black line is drawn at a right angle to it. This shows that the margin line was drawn at a slight angle, barely touching the word therefore at the top and missing the character at the bottom. The red line shows where the margin line was written, and the black line where it should have been written had the characters not been present, as Guy asserts. There is evidence to indicate that in some instances the characters were written as the dictation progressed, and later, when Parrish copied his text into the translation book, the characters were written first. Parrish's shorter document ends with a character and no text, suggesting that the characters were drawn as the dictation progressed. On page 7 of the translation book, 
Page originally drew two characters in the wrong location, and Scratch erased them and repositioned them. This suggests that the characters were drawn first, and then the English, and that Parrish miscalculated the number of lines it would take to copy his previous text into the book. It's interesting because I just read last week in something somebody sent to me that had it, had that, that exact theory was put forward that, you know, the Book of Abraham, it's, you know, they, they use this as a translation method and this is what they did. They took it in order and that you could, and it's, it's clear what Joseph Smith was doing, but looking, again, looking at the evidence, it's not clear what was going on at that time. And, course, and to throw a wrench in the works, all of the alphabet and grammar stuff comes from a different papyrus. Ah, so it's not from... And it's not in Heratic. It's in um, a linear form of Ptolemaic temple glyphs. So they're actually writing the hieroglyphs in there and not... Uh, they're not writing Heratic. So it's not even the same script. And huh. so if this is... If the grammar was used to translate it, then why don't we see more correspondence between the characters that they and the that supposedly made up the one text and then the characters that made up the other if you're going to have a theory you need to you need to you need to account for the data mm-hmm. um, and I think a lot of the critics because they don't read the characters haven't realized that their proposal which, has Joseph Smith pulling the characters off the papyri saying this is the book of Abraham generating this grammar and then deciding to translate the text doesn't actually work Um, and should have been obvious that it didn't actually work because the character they knew they got the characters in the one case from this papyrus fragment and then the other ones come from a different papyrus fragment Hmm. Um, you think they would have noticed that? Maybe, maybe they don't care. <laughs> so. Well, that, that's kind of the uh, the thought I had about the people who put these together. Right, is uh, that they don't really care what the characters are or where they came from, uh-huh. and but this is this is one of those details that's important and why it's useful to at least be able to recognize the characters that you're looking at. Right. And right. Uh, so there doesn't seem to be a matchup there. So the, there's a problem with that theory. Guy is arguing against a straw man. Until the New York Metropolitan Museum turned the papyrus fragments over to the church in 1967, No one knew the origin of the characters in the margins of the translation documents. The critics were among the first to notice that the characters were taken sequentially from Hoare's Book of Breathings, but they made no claims that the alphabets and grammar book were used to create the Book of Abraham, only that they clearly demonstrated Joseph Smith's method of operation. The critics knew very well that the characters in the alphabets and grammar came from the columns that flank facsimile 1. My recent book, published in early 2021, and my videos before that, argue at great length that the alphabets and grammar book are separate translations from the Book of Abraham. This is not a problem for the critics. Rather, it is a problem for Nibley, Guy, and Mielstein, who argue that the alphabets and grammar were reverse-engineered using Joseph Smith's translation of the Book of Abraham. Nibley, who first proposed a reverse translation theory, wrote in 1975, The brethren at Kirtland, Ohio, were invited to try their skill at translation. In 1835, the prophet's associates, miffed by his superior knowledge and determined to show him up, made determined efforts to match up the finished text of the Book of Abraham with characters from the Joseph Smith Papyrus No. 11. But they never got beyond the second line of characters. If they were really trying to translate, they soon demonstrated that it simply didn't work. How would this work? How would they know where to begin? How would they know where to divide the characters? For what purpose? 
How would this show Joseph Smith up? This is pure fantasy. In his 2000 book, A Guide to the Joseph Smith Papyri, Guy also proposed a reverse translation theory. The Kirtland Egyptian papers that have been connected with the papyri appear to be a later attempt to match up the translation of the Book of Abraham with some of the Egyptian characters. If one assumes that the Book of Abraham was the second text on the papyrus of Hor, a possible scenario is that having the translation of the Book of Abraham, the brethren at Kirtland tried to match the Egyptian characters with the translation, but chose the characters from the first text. In 2017, Guy asserted that the grammar seems to have been produced from the Book of Abraham and not the other way round. A decipherer comes up with a translation first, recording insights along the way. Later scholars systematize them into a grammar book from which others will learn the language. Phelps and his associates seem to have envisioned the same process with the Book of Abraham, Joseph Smith's translation coming first and any grammar coming later. The major problem with the reverse translation or reverse engineering theory is that the Egyptian alphabets and grammar book are primarily not about the Book of Abraham. Although some of the material and concepts that are developed in the five degrees of the grammar book albeit in a different context, get worked into the Book of Abraham, such as Egypt being discovered by Ham's daughter while it was still under water. Guy seems oblivious to the fact that his argument that the alphabets and grammar book were not used to create the Book of Abraham also works in the other direction as well and has serious implications for his reverse translation theory. By discarding the reverse translation theory, Guy will find that he can also discard other unsupported speculations that were used to prop it up. For example, it is no longer necessary to argue that the entire Book of Abraham as we have it, and possibly more, was dictated in July 1835, before the Alphabets and Grammar Book. He can also stop arguing that the Grammar Book dates to 1836 rather than from July to November 1835. He can also stop inventing missing Book of Abraham documents and resisting evidence that shows that the Frederick G. Williams and Warren Parrish documents are original simultaneous recordings of Smith's dictation of the Book of Abraham, probably in November, and accept that chapters 3 through 5 were dictated in Nauvoo in 1842, as Smith's journal states. You know, a lot of people have supposed that the writing down the characters uh, comes first. Mm -hmm. In the journal, that comes last. So mm -hmm. when he talks about transcribing Egyptian characters, that's one date, but that's after all the translation has been done. Guy refers here to an entry in Joseph Smith's journal, dated 26th of November, 1835, which mentions that they spent the day in transcribing Egyptian characters from the papyrus. Some have proposed that this might have been when the characters in the margins were added. However, I have provided evidence that the paragraphs were divided awkwardly, and that the characters were integral to the English text, and that the characters were apparently copied as the dictation progressed, or even copied before the text was copied into the translation book. Guy states his assumption as if it were fact, as if there were not other options, when there are several loose sheets with copies of damaged Egyptian texts, to which even Guy has elsewhere suggested the journal entry refers. So this is not a problem. Nevertheless, Guy wants to make something of it. Huh. Um, now, maybe those those transcriptions of the characters are earlier, but if they're earlier, there's no journal entry to match it, and we're missing the ones that are described in the journal entry. The problem, Guy proposes, is contrived. No one expects Smith's journal to be a complete record 
and there are candidates for what was transcribed on the 26th of November other than the characters in the margins of the translation documents. Yet, Guy continues down this erroneous road. So you have to pause it. We're missing some documents. Mm -hmm. If you want to put those early, or you can say, well, let's put them in the day where they said that they're transcribing. And maybe that's not entirely accurate, but you either have to hypothesize miss missing documents or hypothesize that there was no journal entry to correspond with that. So so based, based on the journal entries that we have, it comes after. Yeah, based on the journal entries we have, the only mention is after. So hmm. my inclination is to match the documents we have with that journal entry, but that kind of plays havoc with some of the translation theories. Again, there's no problem here. Guy implies that he is forced to match the 26th of November journal entry with the characters being added to the translation documents, but he has himself suggested that the entry could be referring to two sheets containing hieratic texts. But still, he continues. Right. Uh, again, as a, a scholar, you want to account for as much evidence as possible with your theory, and you want to rely on hypothesized missing documents as the least that you can. No theory that's out there, all of the theories that are out there require missing documents. Hmm. It's just which ones are missing and where you place them and how much you say is missing. And so everybody has to has to hypothesize that we're missing certain documents. It is one thing to acknowledge missing documents for which there is evidence, and quite another to invent missing documents to save a dying theory. We do not have original documents for most of Abraham chapters 3 through 5, for example. But contrary to Guy's assertion, the critics do not need to postulate missing documents to make their reconstruction of events work. Well, there are people who dispute that there are missing manuscripts. I don't know how they account for the evidence. Mm -hmm. But so some of the manuscripts are missing. The question is then how much? How do we know what it's like? Uh, and, and this is where when you look at 18th century or 19th century eyewitnesses that describe scrolls, none of the manuscript fragments we currently have is a scroll, and all of them were mounted by 1837, probably. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Carrie Milstein and Alex Baugh have a nice article on that. Actually, Alex Baugh and Carrie Milstein published an article about preserving the Joseph Smith papyri by gluing them to thick paper about 1837, or at least by 1840. Mielstein later published an article about the long scroll theory, to which I have responded in detail in my videos and book. Using many of the witnesses previously discussed, Mielstein tries to make them say the Book of Abraham came from the long, intact scroll and not the fragments that had been mounted on thick paper and placed in glass frames, which is a distinction they did not and could not make. Some witnesses testified to the opposite of what Guy and Mielstein argue, stating that the fragments contained the writing of Abraham, even his signature. Others merely said one of the rolls contained the writings of Abraham, which was true, because it was the end of the Hor papyrus containing facsimile 3. But that didn't exclude the mounted fragments as the source of the published Book of Abraham. After all, the mounted fragments included facsimile 1. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the descriptions of these papyrus scroll come from after the fragments were mounted so mm -hmm. there's still a scroll kicking around we don't have that scroll mm -hmm. what's on that scroll we don't know um, but you have to you're, we have evidence of a missing scroll your theory has to account for it right um, 
people criticize me for saying that there's a missing scroll. Well, we have evidence for missing scrolls. Uh, now, you can, it's speculation what is actually on those missing scrolls, mm -hmm. but we have eyewitness accounts that put the Book of Abraham on those missing scrolls, uh, actually mm -hmm. on a scroll. Um, these people saw it. Maybe they misunderstood what they were talking about. Uh, that's entirely possible. It's more like Guy misunderstanding them. In his 2016 essay, Mielstein presented seven sources that he believed supported the theory that the Book of Abraham was attached to the end of the Horror Papyrus. I examined these sources in detail in my new book and found that he had consistently misrepresented these sources and made them say what they never intended. Not one of them said that the fragments did not contain the writings of Abraham. One of the main sources for Mielstein and Guy is Charlotte Haven's account of visiting Lucy Smith and viewing the mummies and papyri in Nauvoo in 1843. As previously quoted, she wrote that Mother Smith opened a long roll of manuscript, saying it was the writing of Abraham and Isaac, written in Hebrew and Sanskrit. From this problematic source, Mielstein argues, This is after the fragments we now have were mounted indicating that the scroll, rather than the fragments, were being designated as containing the writings of Abraham. Mielstein's interpretation is absurd. Lucy says no such thing in this account. Moreover, there is nothing in this account to indicate that the long roll was anything more than the approximately two-foot scroll containing the end section of Hor's Book of Breathings, which included Book of Abraham Facsimile 3. No one disputes there is a missing scroll. That's another straw man. What is disputed is that there was another record, the real Book of Abraham, following Hor's Book of Breathings, for which Guy and Mielstein have not one shred of credible evidence. So you have to account for the evidence. And that's so, the So we know based on the evidence there are there there is a missing scroll, but at least we're fairly confident there's a missing scroll. There's at scroll. least one missing scroll. Yeah. There may be two, because one of the things is there are two scrolls mm -hmm. and a bunch of fragments. Right. We have a bunch of fragments. So where are the scrolls? Where are the scrolls? What's on, what's on them? Well, the only description of what's on them is Gustavo Seyfarth, and given what he says is on there and the way he translates other text, um, the best reconstruction we can make of it is something that says beginning of the book of, and I wish I could finish the sentence. Hmm. Guy's statement here results from some very poor methodology and convoluted logic, which has been challenged for many years without altering his course. He and other apologists repeat this argument as if it were established fact. Seyfarth never wrote Beginning of the Book of. That's nonsense. Who would write Beginning of the Book of without completing it? As previously mentioned, in 1856, Gustavus Seyfarth examined the St. Louis Museum's collection of Joseph Smith papyri and found that the purported Abraham scroll was not a record as Joseph Smith had claimed, but an invocation to the deity Osiris, in which occurs the name of the person. Horus, and a picture of the attendant spirits introducing the dead to the judge Osiris. Seyfarth apparently saw the approximately two-foot missing portion of the Hor Book of Breathings, which included the concluding facsimile 3 vignette. This description of the papyrus appears in the museum's catalog for 1856 without quotation marks. So it is uncertain if it accurately reflects Seyfarth's assessment. Yet, Guy uses this to speculate that there was another text on the roll of papyrus Seyfarth examined. Based on papyrus Louvre N. 3284, he surmises that there was at least two columns of text preceding the facsimile 3 vignette, and that since they contained an abridgment of what Egyptologists call the negative confession, Seyfarth would not have called this an invocation, and therefore there was another text on the roll.
His argument is tenuous, to say the least, but he pushed his convoluted logic even farther when he asserted that Saforth saw the words, beginning of the book of. He knows this because the 19th century Egyptologist used the word invocation. According to Guy, invocation wasn't simply the way Saforth described the book of breathings generally. It was the unusual way he translated the first words of the book. Saforth translated another book of breathings as a book of hymns, and instead of translating beginning of the book of breathings as current Egyptologists would, he translated the same characters as the book of hymns. From this, Guy argues that because Saforth translated beginning of the book as book of hymns in another instance, it indicates that Saforth, in identifying a text as an invocation, might have read the beginning lines of another text, one after the book of breathings. So Saforth never said he saw the words book of hymns, let alone beginning of the book. Guy's interpretation does not flow from the evidence, but from fantasy and wishful thinking. Saforth said there was no record of Abraham on the scroll. How much clearer does Guy want Saforth to be? He knew what he was looking at was the end of an ordinary funeral text. He wasn't describing only the part he was looking at, but the entire record as he understood it. Guy's speculation and convoluted logic has been transmuted in apologetic circles as unqualified evidence. Guy himself has said in 1999, Gustavus Seyfarth saw this papyrus in the Wood Museum and describes it, indicating not only that facsimile 3 was still part of this roll, but also that the roll contained another text. Seyfarth's description allows the reconstruction of the opening lines of the new text of the scroll of Hor, which were, beginning of the book of. Unfortunately, Seyfarth's description does not allow us to determine exactly which book was included. Seyforth's description also doesn't allow us to speculate about another book at all. In 2005, Guy asserted, Facsimile 3 came from the middle of a long roll belonging to a man by the name of Hor. The first part of the long roll contained the man's name and titles, followed by facsimile 1, followed by the so-called first book of breathings, four of the six columns of which have been preserved. Facsimile 3 came next, followed by another text, the only portions of which have been preserved are the maddeningly elliptical opening words, beginning of the book of. Based on Guy's publications, one apologist matter-of-factly asserted in 2017, observations by Gustavus Seyfarth indicate that the scroll had a second text on it, beginning near the vignette that became facsimile 3. The following was posted on the fair board in 2021. Unfortunately, the only Egyptologist who ever studied the full scroll, Gustavus Seyfarth, only copied down half of the title of the next book, beginning of the book of, and then stopped. He never told anyone what the book actually was, and then the scroll was destroyed a few years later, so no one else could continue translating it. We have no idea what other book was on the scroll, but it could have been the Book of Abraham. At least, we certainly can't rule out that possibility. Hear me now, Mormon apologists. Seyfarth never wrote beginning of the Book of. It's pure apologetic nonsense. With this, I conclude my response. Mr. Gee, if you are listening to this video, please do not confuse my critique with religious persecution. It is not. My plea to you is to stop inventing these silly arguments. The lost scroll and reverse translation theories are amateurish, to say the least, and your objections to the sequel theory are nonsense. I think it's time that you reconsider the catalyst theory advocated by some of your colleagues, or, preferably, the pious fraud theory 
Why is it on the internet some people think you're such a terrible scholar or a terrible such a terrible person? Why why does that come up? Um I don't know. I it... Well, now you know, Mr. Gee. I'm Dan Vogel. Thanks for listening.